But one of the best things you can do when you're going into giving feedback is to maintain two things in your head. One, that you need to be humble when you're giving feedback, right? You don't have a line to the divine. You don't know <laughs> the truth with a capital T. So you're offering your perspective. And just by making it clear that you're offering your perspective, I think that does a lot to close the gap that exists in lots of feedback conversations. Ideally, feedback is actually a conversation because as you said, feedback is a gift. So the second thing to keep in mind is that your goal needs to be to be helpful to that person. And, and this is where the, 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 some of the magic comes in. I think it is actually incredibly powerful to state your intention to be helpful in the moment. And this is a way that you can show that you care about somebody. So, right, radical candor is caring personally and challenging directly. So, you're a smart business committed to innovation, to service, and to modern marketing. And you're asking, what's next? Wondering how you can become even more innovative. My name is Jürgen Strauss from InnovaBiz, and this is the InnovaBuzz podcast, where we share all kinds of tips, advice, and interview guests on all things innovation and leadership in modern marketing. Hi, innovators. It's great to be back. I hope you've had an awesome week so far. I'm really excited to have on the InnovaBuzz podcast as my guest today, Jason Rosoff, who's the CEO and co-founder of a company called Radical Candor. Now, the name of the company is based on its definition. So Radical Candor is the ability to give feedback in a way that challenges people directly and at the same time shows you care about them personally. The mission of the company is to help leaders and teams build the best relationships of their careers and achieve amazing results as the outcome. This is a really insightful discussion. We talked about leadership, we talked about empowering teams, and we talked about building the best relationships by creating a culture of great feedback. Without further ado then, let's fly into the hive and get the buzz from Jason Rosolf. Hi, I'm your host, Jürgen Strauss from InnovaBiz, and I'm excited to welcome to the InnovaBuzz podcast today, all the way from Palo Alto in California, Jason Rosoff, CEO and co-founder of Radical Candor. Welcome to the podcast, Jason. I'm so glad to be here. Very excited to chat with you today. Yeah, it's a privilege to have you on the podcast. Now, Radical Candor just means saying what you think, but it's also saying what you think whilst caring deeply about the person you're telling what you think about them or about their behavior. So we'll explore that a little bit more with Jason. Um, Ron Carucci of Navalent suggested that we speak to the folks at Radical Candor. So a big hello to Ron. Now, Jason, before we talk about um, Radical Candor and feedback and so on, Let's find out a little bit more about you as a person and your journey. Did you envisage going into business on your own and doing this sort of thing as a young child? No, absolutely not. <laughs> I, I, my goal as a, as a child was, it depends on which age range you're talking about, but my <laughs> first concrete memory of wanting to do something when I got older was to be a paleontologist. I wanted to, I wanted to discover dinosaurs. I wanted mm. to dig in the earth and, and find the remains of civilizations and creatures long past yeah, well, um dinosaurs is a big hobby of a lot of kids <laughs> yes yes um and i remember a couple of other stages as well where i kind of in, imagined that i would be an astronaut or something like that but the good <laughs> news is it all sort of was in the the sciences uh field and eventually i got into computing and that was my sort of transition point into business writ large. I started to think about how my understanding of computers could turn into a career or I could eventually build a business around it. And at some point in my early 20s, I was fairly convinced that someday I would start a company. I just didn't know when or how or what exactly. Mm -hmm. and, and so what was your journey up to where you are today? I would say that it started in, in sort of late high school when I 
got my first real computer and I broke it down. It really, actually wasn't mine. It was my dad's computer. He had, uh, he had taken it from, from work and taken it home uh, so that he could work from home occasionally. And he came home to find me having completely disassembled it and uh, attempting to put it back together. And as I was doing this, I, I realized that I had a real desire, a neat desire to kind of learn about how these machines worked. And over time, that turned into uh, turned from a hobby into a, like a, a real interest. And I, as I graduated high school, I tried to figure out like, how can I in- take the intersection of my interest in computing and my interest in helping people uh, do more with computers because I felt like uh, I knew a bunch and like my family knew very little about computers. So how could I take those two things and turn them into a job of some kind? And at the time, I didn't know any better, but so I decided to go to un- business school as an undergraduate at Stern at NYU in, in New York City. And I learned there sort of like the different ways that people actually form businesses, the different models business, uh, businesses take, the different ways that people were taking technology and applying it to real life problems. And that was the, the point at which I decided, you know, building a company was probably the thing that I wanted to do someday when I realized like, oh, I could take these two things that I'm passionate about, using technology to really help people, taking this thing that I'm knowledgeable about and other people don't know a ton about and actually turning it into a useful thing that people will pay for. Mm. Um, yeah, well, that's, so, that sounds like a fairly common journey. I think that a lot of people um, discover that they're good at computing and that other people need their help or ask for their help and, and then they turn that into some form of business. Yeah, and, and from my perspective, the options coming out of business school were uh, were pretty interesting. I graduated business school in 2001, so right as the dot-com bubble kind of burst. And that was an interesting time to be exiting uh, undergraduate and trying to think <laughs> about how I was going to figure out what was next. But I found that there were actually lots of really interesting opportunities in these sort of click and mortar type of businesses. And I wound up joining one of them, uh, this company called My Publisher, which was eventually acquired by Shutterfly. And what the company did was they made photo books. So we built digital software that people use to upload and arrange their memories, essentially Mm. photos of family vacations and things like that. They sent those to us. We print, printed them and and on archival quality paper, bound them in a hardcover and sent them back to them. So we were like taking these memories and packaging them up. And uh, it was a product that I cared about quite a bit. We had, I learned a lot about how to build a high volume, but high quality business because we were a white label supplier for Apple at the time. So when you opened iPhoto and clicked buy a book, that order also went to us. So we had our own brand and we were white labeling uh, for Apple. And I learned, I learned quite a bit about production, about operations, and about how technology can solve real problems in, in the workplace. Mm. Yeah, I, I remember those services. Uh, I actually made quite a bit of use of those in the early days of digital photographer. I did I have digital photography. I'd be digitizing my slides and film photography so that I could put together those books. Yeah, and it, it was it was a blast. I, I feel like I had my first actual sort of management people leadership experience there, uh, which actually features in my my radical candor stories when I tell them to other people. But at some point, I realized that I, I wanted to move from the sort of hybrid operations engineering product design kind of world to a m- more focused on digital products. So I joined another company in New York City um, called Fog Creek Software. And Fog Creek Software built products for software developers primarily. They had a, a visionary founder that had written this blog. His name is Joel Spolsky. He wrote this, wrote this blog called Joel on Software. Um, and I wanted to work for him because of how, not only how the kinds of things that they made, but also how he thought about the business. He had this mm. really clear perspective on how you treat the people that work for you and how to build a successful business in the long run. And Fog Creek Software um, it, is sort of this parent brand that isn't nearly as famous as the things that spun out of it. So out of Fog Creek Software, came Stack Overflow, which is a site used by pretty much every software developer around the world today. 
and Trello, which is a very, very popular uh, task management or project management tool used by lots of people all around the world. Those, those products started at Fog Creek Software and became their own companies. Oh, okay. I didn't know that. Yeah. Interesting. Mm. So yeah. w when did you then decide you wanted to move into more the soft side of the engineering or computing industry and, and look more in-depth at people management? So it was actually in my next job. I, I, when I left Fog Creek, I had had this kind of hybrid role. I was doing a small amount of people management, mostly sort of like product management, product design type of things, software product design type of things. And I, I had this epiphany, which was I'm really good at this sort of um, this product design stuff, so I'm going to give up on the management stuff. <laughs> I'm just going to go be an <laughs> individual contributor at my next place, um, and the next place turned out to be Khan Academy, which is this online educational not-for-profit that's helped lots and lots of students all over the world, you know, increase their and improve their educational outcomes by providing these really high-quality free resources. And so I, I joined there as the first sort of product manager and designer, but we were four people. Um, and we had raised money from Google and the Gates Foundation. And I didn't really understand or have conceptualized because it was a nonprofit, like I didn't conceive of it as the kind of rocket ship that it became, but we had this like explosive growth, the company started to grow. And as a very early team member, I had a lot of influence on the way that the organization grew, the, the culture that it built. And over time, over the next, I was there for seven years in total, over the next two years, I started to realize that my real leverage, like my real success was that I was, help, I was making the people around me quite successful. Like the people who worked with me went on at Khan Academy and they went on Khan Academy to do great things. And as much as I hated to admit it, it was like, oh, actually I might be good <laughs> at this other thing that I kind of had written off. And it was at that point that I started to really think about like, what am I good at and how might I help other people um, get better at this thing too, because I saw it as a thing that, you know, my team had uh, pretty low turnover um, in in an industry tech in Silicon Valley, where turnover, you know, the average length of employment for most people at companies is eighteen months. You know, my mm. uh, I was doubling that um, mm. on my team, uh, and and I, I started to look at these things and say like, okay, what am I doing differently than other people? And that's when I started to get into the sort of science of management to realize that, and art, it's like this really interesting intersection of those two things, right? Part of it is science, part of it is understanding what is happening, measuring effectively. It's like this real challenge, an interesting challenge in management. And the other part is just diving into the human messy side of relationships and understanding better how people think and how they work. And that combination became more and more interesting to the point that I was like, well, maybe I should spend my time dedicated to this because I seem to be able to reproducibly be able to build success around me. Could I help other people do the same thing? And that's what led me eventually to Radical Candor. Hmm. All right. So tell us about the mission of Radical Candor. Why do you do what you do? Sure. I, I think... Kim and I tell slightly different stories. Kim is the author of the book, uh, <laughs> yeah. and, and I uh, am the CEO of the company. So I'm op helping her kind of operationalize this concept. And when I say operationalize, I mean helping other people implement it. So the reason I got into it, like my mission, is to reduce the amount of unintentional psychic damage that we're doing to one another at work. I feel like there's something about the relationships that human beings have at work that tend to be slightly more dysfunctional than the relationships we have, out, we have outside of work. And I think that has to do with power dynamics and a bunch of other things. But I saw around me over the course of my career the difference between a good boss and what I would, the way I think about that is like a person who has good relationships with their team members and a bad boss, a person who has, you know, let's say neutral or even like net negative relationships mm -hmm. with their team members. Um, I saw that and I, I became kind of obsessed with the idea of working against that. I think radical candor actually is an incredible distillation of the experiences that I had over the you know, 17 years that I was uh, an operator slash manager. And it helps 
it, it helps that it is a simplification. It is a model that people can quickly understand and see how there's a difference between maybe what they're doing on a day-to-day -day basis and what they could be doing that could be better. And so from my, from my perspective, the purpose of radical candor is to improve the state of relationships at work, which in turn um, lowers the amount of sort of psychic or psychological damage you're doing to each other and increases over time, increases the results that people get. So I see it as all kind of one package. Mm -hmm. That's fascinating. I, you know, I'm interested, you said relationships at work and, and it doesn't seem to be as bad of, or as much of an issue in the personal sphere. I think to me, there's a lot of communication aspects around this, and I think um, we don't understand, in general, we don't understand how best to communicate with other people. And I think that plays out in relationships, whether it's in the personal sphere or at work. It's just that in the personal sphere, if you know you don't like somebody or you don't have a high opinion of them, you keep out of their way, whereas at work you don't have that choice. So I wonder, wonder whether there's some of that in I'd there. I like that observation quite a bit. I, I, think, I think that's largely true. I, I, from my perspective, and, and I think Kim shares this perspective, like radical candor is universally human. Right? Mm. The, the axes are care personally and challenge directly. And you could relabel those axes love and truth. And there isn't a culture or a person on the world who I... I, I who would say, who's likely to say that they don't value love and truth. And so it does touch all of our relationships. And I think you are right that essentially it boils down to the way that we communicate to one another is sometimes so ineffective as to be like, it would have been better off not to say anything at all, right? <laughs> yeah. it, it, it can actually destroy value. And one of the issues with communication is that it tends to be really fraught and we don't tend to have great vocabulary to describe it. And that is the thing that is so amazing about radical candor is that it not only, not only does the word, do the words radical candor, care personally and challenge directly exist that describe what good looks like. Kim has done a great job of labeling what the other pieces look like. So when and I'll just walk you through really quickly just to, so, so you can hear the difference and why this is so powerful. So when you challenge directly, but you fail, fail to care personally, we call that obnoxious aggression. Hmm. When you fail to care or to challenge, we call that manipulative insincerity. And that's sort of like backstabbing behavior, um, political behavior, passive aggressive behavior, even like the false apology kind of fits into that category. And then when you care personally, but you fail to challenge directly, we call that ruinous empathy. And the reason we call it ruinous is if you take a simple example, like take a, a, someone walking around with sort of spinach in their teeth, and you think about you not telling that person that they have spinach in their teeth because you don't want to hurt their feelings, right? Like mm. it's obvious to see how ruinous that is because then they just have to be embarrassed in front of other people. Right? <laughs> that's they right. Yeah. Allow them to walk around being embarrassed in front of other people. Mm. So that's why we call it ruinous empathy, even though empathy is generally considered a great thing. Uh, I think when empathy is not combined with uh, a challenge, you can wind up in a situation where you're doing more harm than good. And that, that language turns out to be a really incredibly helpful support to getting people to think about why it's so valuable to try to be radically candid, even though it's difficult. Yeah, I, that's a really great example. And to me, there's an element there of personal ego so if I don't tell that person you've got spinach in your teeth, it's because I might find it embarrassing to tell them that or maybe they'll think he's rude and I want to be liked by that person. And yet, as you point out, uh, by not telling them and by not making them aware of it and if they don't you know, realise it themselves, then they might get embarrassed in every other interaction they have during the day. So... The ego thing is, you know, I've got to put my ego aside and say so I, I, I have a responsibility to do a service to that person and point that out and forget about everything else and then everybody wins. 
Yeah, it, it is. It is interesting. So when when you care about someone's short term feelings so much that you're unwilling to say something that might hurt them, we call that's ruinous empathy. But when mm. your ego, when you're protecting yourself, that's manipulative insincerity. Actually, mm. that that's why we have that category because and it is very subtle. To your point, like there's probably more than one thing at play, right? Culture, human interaction, these things are complicated. Um, and so it, there can be cases where there's overlap between these, these things. But I think if you don't tell someone simply because you want them to like you, not because you care about what happens to them, that is, that is squarely manipulative and sincerity. Hmm. Um, uh, yeah, but a lot, of that, think, a lot of that happens right. unconsciously. Yes, yes, good point. So, you know, to me, the word manipulative kind of implies that it's conscious. But, I, you know, to your point, I think it's, it's a really good point that that's the impact is that it's effectively being manipulative. Yes, exactly. Just like the, the, un, the conscious thing or even the slightly unconscious thing in ruinous empathy is that your intention is, is to be kind, to be nice mm. to that person. Mm. Yeah. But the impact is ruinous. Yeah, that's right. Yep. So talk us through then some of the um, structures and some of the recommendations you have in place in terms of giving feedback to people in a way that it's actually heard, taken on board as, you know, this is a gift. So to me, feedback is always a gift. And even when um, I get feedback that hurts or, you know, I feel, uh, I don't know what the right word is, aggrieved by or whatever, uh, mm. I need to take a step back and say, well, that's my ego again. So what's in that feedback that can actually help me because it is a gift? So what what structures do you have in place or recommendations to people to give feedback in a way that it's actually seen as a gift and it actually makes a difference to the person you're giving it to? Great question. I, I think I'll take one tiny step back and then I'll dive into those recommendations. <laughs> yeah. so the, the, the tiny step back I want to take is that fundamentally what helps feedback to be received in a positive way is your relationship with that person. And and so the order of operations that we typically recommend for radical candor is if you want to be giving feedback to people, you should probably start in general by soliciting feedback from those folks, mm -hmm. by offering praise, and then by offering criticism. Not in a sandwich, not like one right after the other, but like the order of operations should be like, do I really know how this person sees me and sees our relationship? Because that's going to help you think, that's going to help you know how to approach that person with feedback. If you've offered them praise, that person knows that you care enough about them to have gone out of your way to authentically praise the work that they've done. Mm. When you get to the moment that you need to deliver corrective feedback, there is we do have some really helpful things to think about. So one of the best things you can do, and this is not a panacea, it's not magic, but one of the best things you can do when you're going into giving feedback is to maintain two things in your head one, that you need to be humble when you're giving feedback, right? You don't have a line to the divine. You don't know <laughs> the truth with a capital T. So you're offering your perspective. And just by making it clear that you're offering your perspective, I think that does a lot to close the gap that exists in lots of feedback conversations. Because often feedback conversations take the form of this thing happened, this is the truth, you are in the wrong, I am in the right. Mm. And that's not what feedback is about. Like ideally feedback is actually a conversation because as you said, feedback is a gift, but it's a gift in one of several ways. One way it's a gift is like, I give you this feedback, you hear it, you feel like, yes, I actually do see that I do that or this work product could have been better. And so I'm gonna change my behavior approach next time. That's one way that it's a gift. Another way that it's a gift is like, I deliver the feedback, you push back and you say, actually, I see it quite differently. Hmm. And then I learned I was wrong, right? I saw the situation uh, and I changed my mind. Um, so the feedback can be a gift in multiple ways, but like the biggest way that it's a gift is if it creates a dialogue. So the second thing to keep in mind is that your goal needs to be to be helpful to that person. And, and this is where the, 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 some of the magic comes in. I think it is actually incredibly powerful to state your intention 
to be helpful in the moment. And this is a way that you can show that you care about somebody. So, right, radical candor is caring personally and challenging directly. One way that you can demonstrate that you care about somebody else is to say, hey, I really care about your success here. And in order for you to be as successful as possible, I think it's worth considering that in this situation where I observed you doing this thing, that had this negative impact that you may or may not be aware of. Were you aware of that? Um, and starting with the intent, the, the intent to be helpful is another thing that closes that gap. So instead of it being a right and wrong conversation, right, um, by, by being humble, keep it away from right and wrong, and keep it in the realm of helpfulness. Because if they respond, you know, uh, negatively or uh, get, you know, have an emotional response, which is normal, it's normal for people to have an emotional response mm. when someone tells them something negative, um, you can focus on that intent to be helpful. So you don't, you, you can get out of the mindset of like, I'm here to litigate a case, right? To prove my point yeah, yeah, beyond yeah. a reasonable doubt. Um, and, and make sure that in the moment, your, in, your intention is clear and your behavior is towards helpfulness. Does that make sense? Yeah, yeah, that makes perfect sense. And I really like that, you know, pointing out um, the helpfulness. I guess for me, the other thing that you mentioned, it kind of um, because the person giving the feedback you know, isn't the font of all wisdom, as you said, and, and therefore they, they're not necessarily right um, and there may not necessarily be a right or wrong in the situation. So to me, um, if there is a dialogue, if it opens up a dialogue and if that leads to increased uh, possibilities or, you know, more options, more um, alternatives, then, then it's really useful. Absolutely. And, and each of these things is an opportunity to kind of build a bridge. Uh, we often think about offering criticism as the way that you challenge directly and offering praise as the way that you care personally, right? We often relate those two things very strongly and, and we see that very differently. Both cr praise and criticism should combine caring personally and challenging directly. In fact, a pra praise with no challenge, praise with no follow-up, no expectation of future behavior is is often received very insincerely, right? Because it's sort of like, you know, good job is not very helpful praise. But, you know, when you delivered that work early, we were able to get the contractor working earlier, which meant we were able to deliver the whole project under budget. That's a very different kind of praise. And that's the same mm -hmm. thing, the same kind of structure that your criticism should have, right? When yeah, you yeah. were, you know, when you did this, it had this negative impact, the impact as a result. Yeah. yeah. And, um, and that way it's... <laughs> It's kind of removed from the person. It's the behaviour or and the impact, right? Um, no, and and I've got a, I've got a great example because I've still got it here on my screen on my other screen. Um, <laughs> I in my um, remote assistant who does my podcast, um, taking the notes from the podcast audio recording, and she's just new and she did the second one of these yesterday and I gave her feedback and said, hey, great job on that podcast post you did with this guest. I only had to change a few little things that saved me a heap of time. Um, there were a couple of little grammar things that I've pointed out in the edit, but overall it's 99% ready to publish, so well done. You know? So it was kind of here's the impact this has had, saved me a heap of time. Yep. Yep, and that's wonderful. And hmm. and and at just, the same time, also, hey, there's a couple of little improvements that you can do. So, but you know, that wasn't that was kind of like it's not just good job pat on the back. So there's there's okay, there's some things that can be better next time. But it was fabulous already. Yeah, and I I think like in 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 radical candor land. <laughs> Uh, I, I would actually encourage you to, to make the, the improvement feedback even stronger to make sure that okay, yeah. out so mm. the person knows, like, I, I expect that next time you'll, you'll catch these kinds of errors. Like, doesn't mean you did a bad job, right? Mm. It just means that um, if you want to do a great job, a great job includes catching these errors. Mm. Um, what's, your, yeah, what's your feeling, though, on um, combining the praise with the... Uh, catching those errors things in terms of dilute, you know, the risk of diluting the impact of the praise by combining the, the improvement opportunities there as well. 
we uh, there's a there's a colloquial term for that that I, I that includes a, a profanity, but I'll, the, I'll call it the <laughs> feedback sandwich. Yeah, the yeah. Feedback sandwich um, is not something we're fans of, um, mm. and I'm, I've never been a fan of it. Mostly because like when someone delivers feedback in a feedback sandwich, I'm the type of person that is like waiting for the other shoe to drop the entire mm-hmm. time. Uh, so I, I avoid that because it's something that I know I react really negatively to. And to your point, it, it has the potential of diluting both, right? The praise, yeah, yeah. because other people react differently. You know, I think Kim's the type of person when she hears praise, like she indexes on that and the criticism has to be very clear and direct for her to hear it. And so like she might walk away with a very different impression of the same conversation. And so it can be really valuable to tease those things apart. Hmm. So, you know, a simple option might be, you know, praise today and then say, you know, tomorrow, take a moment to say, you know, as I was going through that, I did make these other corrections and I yeah, you know, yeah. hope that you can correct, you can catch those next time. Simple as that. Hmm. Yeah, I think that's probably a good one. And then, you know, as, as I was writing that, I was a little bit conscious of that. So I probably need yeah. to discipline myself a little bit better there. <laughs> All right. From my perspective, um, I feel like if you're giving it at all, you're already batting above average. So if you're not <laughs> yeah. it, uh, most of us avoid these conversations completely. Yeah, yeah. Well, I like. I mean, I like to know how I'm doing as well, and I like to hear from my team. And you know, one one of the one of the things that this lady stood out when we did the interview, which was only about a month ago, um, was that. She she made some comments in the interview which most people wouldn't even dare to say in an interview. I mean, basically, she said, you look a lot better in real life than your photos. <laughs> and, um, you know, she didn't even bat an eyelid or think anything of it. It was just like, here's some feedback. <laughs> you know? And I thought, wow, that's pretty refreshing. Um, yeah. So, yeah, so most people wouldn't. You know, dare to do that in an interview, and then of course you say, "Well, when do they get to the point where they're comfortable giving some honest feedback to the boss?" Yeah, yeah, absolutely. I think this is the question, right? From my perspective, this is the reason why it's worth building a business around radical candor, is because for a lot of people, a lot of people are not in the situation that you're in. Right? You're incredibly receptive to feedback. She seems very willing to deliver feedback. That is like a match made in heaven. It's mm. also incredibly rare. So the reason why I'm doing this work and why I think this work is valuable, why I think a company should exist around it is because it takes real time, effort, energy to change this. People need support in making those changes. And that's why that, that is a great place for a company, right? Like there's real value to be gained there. Hopefully, um, enough value to justify, you know, myself, my time, and mm. hopefully over time, other people's time uh, in supporting people to do that. Yeah. Well, I know um, in my long corporate career that there was a lot of the bad behaviours you described earlier, and either people didn't give feedback because they were concerned about not being liked, um, or they they were in so the ruinous empathy or they were in the um, in the obnoxious aggression or manipulative insincerity. I certainly had a lot of that, you know, where people were undermining you, even even bosses that would undermine you. And then when you yep. did when you had a performance review, which often would be just once a year, all of a sudden you'd be confronted with these things that were total surprises because nobody had told you you know, when those situations happen that, hey, that, you know, that behavior that you did then is kind of not really good. <laughs> yeah, it would have been nice to know that, like, you know, 12 <laughs> months ago. When yeah, that's happened. right. Yeah. <laughs> so And so it becomes a, okay, we're going to penalize you in the performance review for that rather than pick it up at the time and say, you know, it would be great if you could do this a little differently because then your performance would just be so much better. Yeah, we've all heard the phrase practice makes perfect, but mm. I actually think that the correct phrase is practice makes permanent. <laughs> yeah. Uh, which is why it's so valuable to correct these small things early because when people see either correct the things that need to be corrected or praise the things that are going well because that kind of information is incredibly valuable at really 
you know, driving home those behaviors that are going to make someone successful. And so, you know, totally agree. Like the whole idea, you know, radical candor is based on this idea that like, if you can have these regular two minute conversations in the hallway, as you're passing at the end of a phone conversation, casually, uh, you can bring up this type of feedback. You can address these things much sooner. You can address them while they're smaller. And as a result, you can build better behaviors much faster um, hmm. with, with, you know, with your team or with your partner or whomever it is. Yeah, yeah, great point. Um, so you do a lot of work with bigger organizations and I'm wondering, you know, because there's recommendations and there's a structure to this process and people can learn that, but what, how do you go about addressing the issue of the culture? Because if the culture is not there from you know, the organisation and from the top of the organisation down, then individuals trying to run a process like this um, are really pushing a rock uphill, right? Uh, yes, yes. The Sisyphus, like that, the, yeah. that myth of a person perpetually... You know, pushing a rock uphill is not the feeling that we want people to have hmm. when they start to, to use radical candor. And so there are, you're right that if a culture is not accepting of the concept of radical candor in general, that you, the rock is much heavier. <laughs> it's much bigger. Yeah. It's, not, it's not impossible, but it may be impractical in the short term to change an entire organization or move an entire organization towards radical candor. There are a couple of things that I've seen help with that. One of them is if you can start at the top, if you have a leader, an executive, especially in the C-suite, especially like the CEO or president or whatever the organization, who can genuinely say, I don't think we've been doing a good enough job of this, and I am going to commit us as an organization getting better at it. I've seen that lighten the load that other people have to bear as they try to push the rock uphill. Cause there is some of that, right? There, it, it's, it's a, it's a, it's a difficult thing to change culture, but I've seen that help dramatically, especially because all of these behaviors, feedback in general revolves around the willingness to give feedback revolves around a sense of psychological safety, right? Like if you mm. don't feel safe, it's very unlikely that you're going to give this type of stuff. And one of the best ways to make it feel safe to give feedback is for you as a leader to say, I'm committing myself to getting better at this. And I'm going to start today by soliciting feedback from all of you. I'm going to hear what you have. I'm going to take it first. <laughs> yeah. Right. Uh, uh, and then we'll think about, and then I'm going to have all of my managers start soliciting feedback. And once we've done that, uh, then we'll start offering praise and criticism. Uh, to folks on the team. So that's the other thing that can help is like following the order of operations, I, I think helps quite a bit because it de-risks, it increases the sense of psychological safety, it de-risks these individual behaviors. And culture is like this fascinating thing, right? We often refer to it as this sort of amorphous uh, entity. But from my experience, culture is really the cumulative interactions that you have with people on a daily basis, which is how you have different cultures on different teams within a larger organization. Hmm. And so it's really about getting people to start these behaviors, getting people to start having these conversations, getting people to build a sense of safety, getting managers especially to build a sense of safety by soliciting feedback on a regular basis that starts to change the culture. That's, that is what it looks like. The hard work is like sustaining that over time because especially if you don't have leadership on board, I think it can be incredibly difficult. That said, some organizations are so large that the other thing we've seen be really effective is building what I like to call pockets of excellence inside of an organization mm. where you have a leader who is the leader of a team within a larger organization and says, I really believe in radical candor. I want to make this work on my team. And from our perspective and our anecdotal evidence is like people who have teams like this tend to outperform. Uh, and what happens is like maybe the culture of the organization is really performance focused, which is pretty typical for lots of organizations that I've worked with. And you start looking around and saying like, Hey, why is that team doing so well over there? What's different about their team? Yeah, yeah. Oh, one of the things that's different about their team is that they're doing this radical candor thing. And all of a sudden, you know, the, the resistance to the idea of a culture change starts to melt away when people say, see like how that it can actually produce better results. Hmm. So that's 
where there is a learning um, environment to the culture so that they do look at that, say, what can we learn from that team because they're performing so much better than other teams. Exactly. Yeah. And that's, that's not present everywhere. <laughs> yeah, <laughs> that's right. <laughs> the, introspection, the introspection that you just described isn't present everywhere. So. Mm. Mm. All right. Well, this is really fascinating. I could go on and talk a whole lot more about this topic and there's heaps more to uh, learn about it, but we'll refer people to your website and also to Kim's book because I think that has a lot of examples in there and explains the concepts a lot more. I'd like to move on though now to the buzz, which is our innovation round and it's designed to help our audience who are primarily innovators and leaders in their field with some tips from your experience. So I've got five questions that I'll ask and hopefully you'll give us some really insightful answers that'll inspire people to go away and do something awesome today. I'll do my best. <laughs> okay. So what's the number one thing anyone needs to do to be more innovative? So from my perspective, it's really developing a finely tuned way to say no to lots and lots of things. Mm. I, I feel like often innovation is seen as um, this activity that you or set of activities that you do, but from my perspective, innovation really starts by creating space for different kinds of thinking than you do on a day-to-day -day basis. And the only way that you can do that is by saying no to lots of things that would be otherwise incremental. If your goal is innovation, you need to get really good at saying no to these the million things that are going to come up that are great ideas but are fundamentally incremental. That's great advice. And I'd, um, I can't remember which guest this said this. It was a little while ago around you can have lots of ideas, but they're no, of no value until they're actually implemented. So that is about making time to see something through into concrete, into a concrete result and hence saying no, yeah. And the, the power of focus, I talk quite a bit about the power of focus, so I really love that. All right. Um, what's the best thing you've done to develop new ideas and new products? So from a leadership perspective, I think it, it has been having a beginner's mind. I think one of the things that I've seen squash innovation more than anything else is a leader's sort of hubris. There are that when they pretend that they can accurately predict the future, when they, they pretend that they know what and where an idea is going to lead. <laughs> hmm. And the from my perspective, the willingness to say what if, the willingness to say how might we is incredibly powerful. The willingness to put aside your your judgment and to put aside your even your experience of, you know, maybe this thing is kind of like that other thing and maybe that won't work out. Uh, those things tend to squash any real innovation conversation very early. Most of the really cool innovative things that I've seen have not started from some grand new idea, but have started from a realization off of a small other idea. So to give you a concrete example of what I mean, I, I think back at, um, at Khan Academy, we had a, uh, a series of things that we did where we were kind of building game mechanics out. And we had this idea of um, building out badges for people who are doing math problems on our site. And to do that, we built out this mechanic that um, allowed people to get streaks, like high numbers, like the number of times they could answer a question correctly in a row. This is all in service of this game mechanic thing. But we learned that that was also really incredibly powerful as a learning mechanic, that when people did that, it increased the likelihood that they would learn. And so we built this innovation out of this idea, which is very tangential. Mm. Um, and so being open to the possibility that this could lead to something amazing is really where that started um, and not judging too soon its, the, its effectiveness because we learned something we didn't expect. Yeah. That's great advice, and, and again, one of my other guests recently said run lots of experiments, so in, in a sense that could lead to those kind of discoveries where you might have intended one thing, but you find that tangential effect that is actually the greater value for it. Yes, exactly. Hmm. 
All right. What's your favourite tool or system for improving productivity and allowing you to be more innovative? It's a good question. I wish I had a great answer. <laughs> uh, I, I feel like, from my perspective, the thing that I've learned about innovation is you want tools that allow you to think new thoughts, and that's really hard to find. I think most hmm. tools wind up being these incredibly tight boxes yeah. that you play in. Um, and and so the, the thing that I tend to focus on is, like, how can I get as close to the medium that I want to be working in as possible? And so when I think about innovating around radical candor, which is fundamentally about human relationships and human communication, I can't start by writing. If I start by writing, like, I'm in a dangerous spot because, like, I'm out of the medium where I want to be working. Hmm. So I need to start by observing. I need to start by participating in these human conversations. And then I can distill. This is exactly what Kim did with her book, right? She took 10 years of lived experience, right, more than 10 years of lived experience, decades of lived experience, and condensed it down into this thing. But she couldn't have written the book if she started by writing. So find hmm. a way into the medium that you actually intend to be working or as close as possible to the medium that you intend to be working in start there yeah yeah that's great advice so in a way it's um whatever it is you're working on immerse yourself in that and begin there and then yes take that experience and convert it to the new idea or whatever <laughs> yeah as best you can avoid abstractions <laughs> yeah all right what's the best way to keep a project or a client on track? So I, I, I recently had a conversation with my wife where she made me think about this in, in kind of a different way. So a very similar question, which is basically, so she's a, um, a grief counselor. And one of the best ways that you can keep something on track is by really understanding the goals of the person that you're working with, hmm. right? A counselor is not in charge of the the pro even though it seems like they should be, right? Like a, a counselor should be doing something to their client uh, to make them better, right? Yeah. That, that seems like what should be happening. But in fact, it's the client who leads the counselor to what they need. And then the counselor helps by supporting with what they need. And I feel like that's the same in almost all client businesses. Like if you really understand the needs of your client, you're really focused on those, that helps you figure out what the client is looking for and then matching that with what you need in order to be successful. I think the moment you, you pitch from a place of like, this is what I need abstractly, you know, away from what you, you know, you, my client needs, I think that's, that's a really quick way to get things <laughs> to find yourself uh, pretty off track. Mm, I so love that answer <laughs> because what I've, I've been doing a lot of work recently around um, our 12 step marketing process and the first step of that is understanding your ideal client and understanding their needs and their you know, fundamental desires and so many people skip over that step and jump straight into like building a marketing program or uh, advertising or whatever it might be so the tactics um, without that understanding so I love it. Yeah, and it's totally natural too, right? Like, you know how you would want the product marketed to you. And that's the thing that you start saying. Yeah. In the same way, like, I know how I want this project to go, and so I can tell you exactly how I want it to go. But that is immaterial if you want it to go a completely different way. Yeah, that's right. All right, what's the number one thing anyone can do to differentiate themselves? Yeah, this question seems to take on more significance uh, <laughs> as time goes by, uh, right? Like the, every area gets, gets more and more crowded. Hmm. I, I, think, I, I think the thing that I encourage people to do to really differentiate themselves, both in business and in life in general, is like stand in your own reason. Like take time to think about a thing for yourself. It is very natural, I think, for, especially for high-performing people to be like, I'm just going to go and see what everybody else has done in this area, and then I'm going to take all those influences and I'm going to come up with something on my own, which is great as long as you actually give yourself the space mm. to really come up with something on your own. But I think too often we get, we get scared. We get scared. It's very exposing. It's very vulnerable to actually be original. To be to set yourself apart is incred is an incredibly um, uh, vulnerable act. 
And, and so I think people kind of chicken out at the last minute. And so what I, what I encourage people to do is like create a space where you can do that. And when you're first trying to differentiate yourself, when you're trying to come up with a new idea, like don't give it to your toughest critic first, right? Like find <laughs> a friendly audience, like give it some time to breathe, like give that differentiator some time to breathe. Cause just like any other innovative idea, anything that distinguishes you from other people, it is going to be somewhat fragile at first. Um, mm. Uh, and, and especially if it makes you very different, it can be, it can be off-putting to some people, um, right? It could, it could make people confused in some cases, but you need time to actually work through that stuff. So that, that's my advice is if you're differentiating yourself, understand that it's an act. It requires an act of vulnerability. Um, and, and when you realize that you are actually onto something that is quite different, it may take time for you to figure out like who the ideal customer is for that thing or all the other pieces that might have to fit in order for that differentiator to actually work for you. Yeah. There's so much great advice in that. So um, I know, and I can't remember, was it Isaac Newton or one of the famous scientists who said that he's standing on the shoulders of others who went before him. So that, you know, every, every great genius I think has, built on the body of knowledge and modeled themselves off of their mentors, but then contributed something unique on top of that. And that's where that vulnerability, vulnerability thing comes in. It's hard to say. Um, yeah. Where, yeah, you've, you know, you've got to be prepared to be vulnerable to do your own thing then. And, and I like the advice of give it time to breathe and don't be discouraged um, by yeah. kind of people saying, well, that's a different way to do it. I'm not sure I like that. <laughs> like, that's what you want some people to say. If yeah, yeah, that's right. That, it's probably not the best idea. Yeah, but yeah. You want some people to say, like, that doesn't sound like it's for me. Like, you're probably on. Exactly, that. yeah, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> exactly, because that's what's part of differentiation, isn't it? So you're, you're only suitable for people you work well with. Yeah, yeah mm. exactly. All right. Well, thanks for getting us through the buzz. So what's the future for you and for Radical Candor? So I think the future for us is um, right now we're focused on a couple of sort of large goals. One of them is right now we have the book and the podcast. These sort of like low cost or free resources that are not very interactive, that don't get as close to the medium uh, as we would like. And the workshops that so we offer in-person workshops where we will fly to somebody's company and actually work with their team to help them understand the concept of radical candor, uh, help them come up with a plan for how to work with it after we leave. One of those is in the tens of dollars and one of those is in the tens of thousands of dollars. It mm. feels like there should be something in between. In between. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Mm. Uh, that, that allows people to get a significant chunk of the benefit with a lower investment because our, our goal again is like to help these ideas spread. We believe that if they spread, people will develop better relationships. They'll do better work. They'll lower the amount of, you know, unintentional damage they're doing to one another at work. Uh, and so that, that's one of our goals is figure out something that um, has and in, increases our ability to scale, to reach more people. Um, but at the same time, you know, honors the fact that we know that a lot of this work has to be done person to person. So that's, that's probably the, the biggest thing that we're looking into. And we have lots of little experiments planned, actually, to mm. help us start to validate what, what some of those things might be. That's great. Look forward, to, look forward to seeing what comes out of that. There might be an online training course or online mastermind or something by the sound of it. Yep, yep, there might be. There might be. We're, <laughs> we're, we're, we're working it out as we speak. I think yeah. those are the types of things that, exactly the types of things that we're considering. Mm. Um, and we're trying to figure out how to bring those human elements into those types of experiences in order to make it really impactful, make it very yeah. real for people. Yeah, that's right. That's that's certainly the challenge with those is getting getting that human interaction there and and making the lasting change. And I know you talked in one of the podcasts about um, how to work with remote teams and giving feedback in remote teams. So that those challenges, obviously, when you put online programs up, um, come into that. Yep. All right. So what's the number one piece of advice you'd give to any business owner who wants to be a leader in their field and in innovation? <sighs> 
Yeah, that, that's a big, <laughs> a big question. I feel, I feel like my instinct is to say, remember that your attention is your most valuable resource. Um, this is something I find myself thinking about quite a bit. Like, if you want to be a leader, if you want to set yourself apart, if you want to be an innovator, uh, all, all, you can't do all the work yourself, right? Like, that's, mm. that's, the, that's the reason why business forms exist, right? That's the reason why we can have put multiple people into groups and use our collective effort to do something more. Um, and, and so I think a lot of people think about that and they think about delegation, uh, right? Like, how, like, could I create more time for myself in that way? But often we don't manage our own attention, right? We, we allow these things to sort of like creep into our, even our peripheral vision, take up space in our brain. Um, and, and I think I have found that when I do that, when I allow that to be messy, it's, uh, I'm much less effective of a thinker. Like I, I'm much less clear in my vision for the future. Um, and so I, I think that's probably the thing that I would ask people to do is, really try to manage your attention. And, and it can be very difficult because as a business leader, there are going to be a lot of things demanding your attention. I have, believe me, mm -hmm. <laughs> a lot of things uh, yeah. are, are demanding my attention on a regular basis. And, and I know that if I don't set aside time where I'm really managing my attention, the, it's going to be incredibly hard for me to, to make real progress in, in thinking or acting. That's great advice, and it's it's interesting. I we're just working on the editing of an interview with Neen James, who's the author of the book Attention Pays. So her message in that book is, you know, what you pay attention on gives you the payback, and and so I like the comment you made there. Your attention is your most valuable resource, which. Uh, you know, yep, going to be one of the great quotes from the podcast. So thanks, Jason. This has been really great. So where can people reach out to you and say thank you for what you've shared with us today? Absolutely. They can, if they want to reach out by email, um, they can find me at jason at radicalcandor.com. Um, or if they wanted to get find out more about Radical Candor, feel free to uh, send us a, a tweet or find us on LinkedIn uh, at Candor. Okay, and we'll have uh, links to all those resources in the show notes as well as to the book and the podcast. So finally then, who would you like me to interview on a future Nova Buzz podcast and why? Let's see. I don't know all the people you've interviewed in the past. So um, the, there was one person that uh, this book that I've been reading recently um, – called oh it just slipped out of my brain <laughs> um multipliers that's the book that i'm thinking of um and this is about w why some bosses are um like increase the amount of sort of new things that happen around them and other bosses seem to like sm smush <laughs> yeah. things that, that, that happen around them. Uh, and the author of the book is Liz Wiseman. Uh, uh, yes, right? Liz Wiseman. Okay. Yeah. That sounds, uh, and, sounds fascinating. Yeah, it, it, it is, it's really interesting because it sort of like combines a little, again, this like it, it combines the art and science parts of management and, and takes a look at you know, what he, the impact that a boss can have and how you can observe it. Um, and I've been really kind of fascinated with this, this idea as a way of getting into uh, getting bosses to think about why radical candor can be so important because often it is how you communicate and how you relate to the people around you that has these impacts. Mm. All right. Well, Liz, if you happen to be listening to this, look out for an invitation from us to the Innova Buzz podcast, courtesy of Jason Rosoff of Radical Candor. So thanks again. Jason, for sharing your time and your insights, your attention, your most valuable asset or resource with us on the Innova Buzz podcast so generously today. I've really enjoyed this. It's been a lot of fun. I've learnt a lot. I wish you all the best for Radical Candor and its future, and let's keep in touch. Will do. Sounds great. Thank you so much for having me on. I'm glad to have this conversation. Thanks.
there you have it, another fun and very educational interview. I hope you learned as much from Jason as I did and enjoyed our discussion. All the ideas and tips that Jason shared with us can be found at innovabiz.co forward slash Jason Rosoff. That is J-A-S-O-N-R-O-S-O-F-F. Or lowercase, or one word, innovabiz.co forward slash Jason Rosoff. You'll also find contact information for getting in touch with Jason there as well as links to the website and the book Radical Candor by Kim Scott. Of course, your first opportunity to put Radical Candor into practice is to leave feedback on this episode underneath the blog post, and we'd love you to do that. Jason suggested I interview Liz Wiseman, who's the author of the book Multiplies on a future InnovaBuzz podcast. So Liz, keep an eye on your inbox for an invitation from us to the Innova Bus podcast, courtesy of Jason Rosolf. Stay connected. Head on over to iTunes or Stitcher or Pocket Casts and subscribe to the Innova Buzz podcast so you make sure you'll never miss another episode. We'd also love you to leave us a review because what you think matters. Take some of the ideas you've heard today and apply them in your business. Any thoughts, ideas, suggestions or questions, share them in the comments below the blog post. And remember, if you want to get better marketing results than you ever have, join our fantastic LinkedIn community at the Transformational Marketing Academy. All you have to do is go to innovabiz.co forward slash tmac. It's free to join. Hope to see you there soon. Until next time, I'm Jürgen Strauss from InnovaBiz. Remember to be awesome and keep innovating. <laughs>